Caring for kittens is no easy feat. That's why we've partnered with the National Kitten Coalition to host the Online Kitten Conference, a whole weekend of learning how to care and support the smallest and most vulnerable felines. Join us the weekend of June 10th through 12th. Details and registration are available now at the communitycatspodcast.com. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we are listening to part two of the audio trapper tips and tricks that we are doing in partnership with Neighborhood Cats and in sponsorship with Tomahawk Traps. So enjoy the audio session. If you are interested in seeing the webinar, feel free to check the show notes or go to communitycatspodcast.com, click on virtual education, and that will lead you in the right direction to watch the recording. But enjoy part two of Trapper's Tips and Tricks, and we'll see you next week. All right, everybody, this is a question you've all been wanting to answer. What is your favorite bait? Fancy Feast, Sheba, or other tasty wet food? Rotisserie chicken, Spam, or roast beef? Herbs, silver vine, catnip, or valerian root? Fish like tuna, mackerel, sardines? Or I just use what they normally eat. All right, and close the poll, share the results, kind of all over the place. So fish like tuna, mackerel, and sardines, 61%. Fancy Feast at 20%. Rotisserie Chicken, it's only got 6%. Catnip, Silver Vine, Valerian, and then just whatever they are currently eating. If there's something we forgot to put in this poll, please put it in the chat. Looks like, oh, everybody's got KFC in here. Turkey, Vienna Sausages. I think it's Mini Max or Mic Max. Prosciutto, that's another one. So there you go, Brian. There's the whole collection (laughs) for you. Okay, so... um One of the purposes of that poll was to show you the variety of things that you can try. And and so don't be afraid to experiment. There's no right or wrong answer to any of that. You know, most people go with fish and that usually works well. Although, like I said earlier today, try to mix up two baits. If you use uh, fish, then put a little bit of fancy feast of like some kind of chicken flavor or something in the bait dish as well so that you can get the cat that likes one, but not necessarily the other. And don't don't be afraid to experiment anything that's really uh, pungent and juicy. And, you know, herbal stuff, like especially valerian root, in our experience, is really attracts cats. And you can use baits in combination. Like if we're using a, a regular trap, we might have like a, a fish-chicken combination as bait. Then we might put a couple of drops of valerian root on the trap mat or something like that to get their attention. So you can, you know, mix it up and and don't be afraid to try different things. And sometimes for those of you who answered, you feed them what they're used to. Sometimes that's the best thing because it's just, again, they're such routinized creatures that sometimes that's what works. You may be trying all these fancy baits and wondering, well, how come they're not going in? And then you just put their normal meal in. Usually they need something a little more attractive, but sometimes not. So if all else fails, don't be afraid to just feed them what you're used to. Now, for those of you who want to get really fancy, this is a a tip for a bait to get your tough tomcat. So the trick is, so if you've got a tomcat, and especially one that you know he comes around, like he doesn't necessarily hang out in the colony, but being a wandering male and all that, he, he comes by at the same time every day. But you put traps out and he just he just keeps on walking and doesn't even pay attention. So this is for when you're really desperate to get the tomcat. You can get urine from a female in heat and you pour that onto a paper towel or a rag and put it either under a drop trap or inside a box trap. It has to be less than 24 hours old. It fades really quickly. How do you get female in heat uh, urine? Well, you can get it from your spay-neuter clinic. Talk to them because typically before they perform surgery on a female cat, they do what's called expressing the bladder, which is they the cat sedated and then they squeeze the cat's bladder so that it's empty. So it reduces the risk of the bladder getting nicked during the spay. They can express and they can tell when they're expressing the bladder whether or not the kitty is in heat. 
So they can um, express that into like a little vial or a little jar and notify you right away. So have them on the lookout and then just be ready to spring into action once they have a vial for you, because it's, again, it's only going to be good for about 24 hours. But that's how you can get your Tomcat to walk over and um, become interested in a trap. Now, here's a tip for those of you who the problem with the bait is that it gets full of ants and bugs and things like that because you're putting it out on the grass. Well, ants and most insects cannot cross water. So this is what you do. You get a little little plastic container and um, put water in it and then put your bait inside something waterproof and put that in your moat and you will remain ant free in this manner. Make sure you don't use something that's so big that it will interfere with the trip plate closing. So small container, waterproof container inside a larger one that's got water. Uh, here's some ideas for creating uh, trails. Again, trying to attract the kitties out. I think pounce is still out there, but if it's not, what you need is a dry treat, cat treat that easily crumbles. And what we'll do is we'll create a trail leading from the front of the trap out like several feet. And it's the same idea with the trap bat. You know, the kitty gets a, a sniff of the uh, treat and starts to follow it towards the trap. You can also use fish oil uh, for the same idea. You get these little fish oil capsules and bring on an all AWL with, with you so you can puncture it and then squeeze it out onto the trap mat or in front of the trap. A couple of other ideas to attract cats over are uh, like a butter spray at the front of the trap and also a catnip spray. Don't go too crazy with the catnip, either the herbal form or the spray form, or you may end up with kitty just rolling around in the catnip and then walking away from the trap. So use it sparingly. One of our favorite tips, because we use it all the time, is to use sound. So what you see here is an iPhone on top of the trap with a speaker attached to it to amplify the sound. And depending on the kind of trapping you're doing would determine the kind of sound that you're using. So if you're trying to catch a female cat, maybe you've got the kittens and now you're trying to catch the mom, go to YouTube and play a video of kittens crying for mom. Always a good idea to screen the videos ahead of time so you're not searching for a good one while you're out there in the field, but you can just call it right up, start playing it, find one that you know lasts for more than 30 seconds, but that goes on for several minutes. You can get a mom calling kittens. Um, you can get a cat in heat, also another way to attract tomcats. Uh, mouse squeaking, bird cries, whatever it is, cats are very sensitive to sound. And again, what you're trying to do is get them close to the trap so they can smell the bait and start working their way in. And just want to give you a quick case study of a kitty, uh, this little kitten. That's Violet, who grew up to be the cat that was in the trap map video but this was her when she was just a tiny little thing. And what happened was we were working at a hotel and they brought us this uh, Violet, this little kitten in a laundry basket. And she was found inside a storage room that was a huge storage room full of beds and mattresses and furniture. And her mom was in there somewhere. But she, Violet, when we got her, she was just too weak to use you know, as bait herself. You know, We had to feed her right away and, and we couldn't really stick her under a trap. So we used a YouTube video of a kitten crying for her mom, and we placed the phone under the drop trap, and mom came running out, clambering over the top of the mattresses and box springs and stuff like that, uh, went right under the drop trap, and we caught her. So it's really, really a very effective technique. I mentioned using kittens for bait for the mom, and you can also do vice versa. So here's step number one, put the kittens or the mom, depending which one you're after, in a carrier. You put the carrier behind the rear of the trap so that the visual for the cat is through the back of the trap. That's how they're going to see, the mom's going to see her kittens. And then you do step number two, which is you cover the carrier and the back of the trap with a sheet. So now the only way the mom can see to get to her kittens or the only way the kittens can see to get to their mom is by going into the trap towards the back. Again, speaking of kittens, if you're using a spring-loaded trap or if you're using the true catch gravity trap, you can use a technique. You can't do this with the GT606, that new gravity trap, because there's only one setting. But with these other traps, you can do what's called setting the trigger lightly. 
Now, normally you would bring that trigger all the way forward so that the elbow was resting against that brass cylinder. But with a kitten, what you can do is set the trap so just the tip of the hook is resting against the brass cylinder. And when you do this, it requires a lot less weight for the trip plate to be set off. So if you're you know, going after a very small kitten, now we actually with kittens recommend if you're using a spring-loaded trap like the uh, 606NC that you use the bottle and string technique so that you can control when the trap door shuts. Because we like to say, you know, kittens are like freshmen in college, you know, they travel in bunches. So you don't want a situation where a kitten's setting off the spring door that comes slamming down while there's another kitten at the front of it. And the way you can avoid that is by using the bottle and string and shutting the door manually. But sometimes you can't do that. Maybe there's just one kitten and you can use this technique. Or you might be using the true catch gravity trap, in which case you really don't have to worry about the door hurting anyone. Um, here's a few other hacks real quick. Uh, headlamps, just a great thing if you're trapping at night, freeze up your hands. If you're trapping at night, make sure you have a headlamp. It's really a time saver and makes life a lot easier. We always have a pair of binoculars with us uh, to try to spot ear tipped cats. The trail camera, you can set that if you're trying to figure out how many cats are at a location or if you're trying to figure out what's their pattern, when do they show up. You can get one of these trail cameras on Amazon and set them so they're motion activated and they'll take pictures and record the times and then you can download it and see what's going on at that spot and that can help a lot with figuring out where and when to trap. Clear rear door is something that we designed with a tomahawk and it's exactly what it says it is. It's plexiglass and it basically creates the illusion. So I mentioned earlier how we need to get the cats hungry because they're wary of going into these narrow enclosed spaces. So the clear rear door will trick a lot of cats and think that there's two ways out and make them less frightened about going in. It's pretty amazing how well it can work. But big, big caveat with this is it's so good that once they're caught, you know, they're frantic and they're trying to get out and they still think they can get out the back door. And they're likely to go running into it at full speed. You never use a clear rear door unless you have a visual on the trap and can cover it very quickly. Don't put it out in the field. It, you know, if you're doing a large trapping and you might go around and every half hour or so check the traps, you can't use clear rear doors in that situation because the cat could get badly hurt by the time you get there. So only use the clear rear door when you've got your eyes on the trap at all times. And then there's the uh, laser pointer. And I just put, we put a little graphic like that, this together. And um, this is great for especially kittens. If you've got kittens who like, for whatever reason, they just ate or they're just reluctant to um, go near a trap, well, you can get them to start playing with the red dot. We call it the red fly. And you start making it move around where they are and uh, they'll start playing with it. And then they kind of forget their fear and they forget where they are. And you can run them right into it, right into the trap. Really great tool to have around. Hey, let's talk a little bit about wildlife. What happens if you accidentally catch a raccoon? All right. So they're very um, gentle animals, raccoons, but they can be very dangerous, obviously, because of the risk of rabies. And it can be very dangerous to them, not only to you if you get scratched, because, you know, then it's literally off with their head to see if they actually have rabies. So you really want to avoid any physical contact with a raccoon. So how do you do that? Well, you know, this guy we caught on a Manhattan scaffold, believe it or not, near a park. So in order to restrict his movement, we very carefully put uh, trap dividers in so he couldn't move around the whole trap and uh, we wouldn't be that close to him. And then we slid a broomstick between the trap handles and with two people literally carried the trap you know, to the closest tree and let him go. So just be very careful. Their fingers are very long and very dexterous and you want to keep a physical distance from them out of fingers reach really at all times ever wanted to quickly connect collaborate or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are you know real people look no further than maddie's pet forum maddie's pet forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together we share ideas expertise offer each other support resources and more 
Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. Could your animal welfare organization use a tune-up? Humane Network can help. You can get a free 30-minute consultation to talk through your challenges and get ideas on how your organization can be more successful with less stress. From board development and fundraising to strategic planning and operations, Humane Network has got you covered. Whether you're a large or small, nonprofit or government, it's a live and thriving program led by a certified animal behavior consultant features specially designed training for shelter and clinic staff on enrichment, stress reduction, safe animal handling, and behavior modification. With Humane Network, you receive individualized advice and support customized to meet your organization's unique needs. And Humane Network can lighten your load by taking on fundraising, communications, and other tasks you struggle with. Contact Humane Network today for a free 30-minute consultation. Visit humanenetwork.org. That's humanenetwork.org. Team Dubert is at it again, and now they have an amazing companion case management module that once again revolutionizes how you rescue animals. Dubert partnered with Dallas Pets Alive and the Spay Neuter Network to build a powerful solution that allows you to manage cases of any kind. Whether owner surrender calls or emails, community cat tracking and reporting, Dubert is the only system that integrates two way text messaging, automatic follow ups, and even a rehoming solution that every organization can use. No more trying to manage 10 different technologies when everything is all in one place and tightly integrated. From fostering to transport, fundraising to e-commerce, supply and demand to case management, Dubert has everything you need to streamline your operations so you can focus on saving more animals. Check out the new companion case management module at www.dubert.com slash CCM and get signed up today. Okay, how about skunks? Well, nobody likes to get uh, sprayed, obviously. So what you can do with these guys is keep in mind a couple of things. One is that they spray from their anal glands. So from their rear end, if their rear end is facing you, you're in trouble. And just before they spray, they'll warn you. They'll start stamping their feet. So if you've got a skunk who's stamping his feet and starting to turn his rear end towards you, uh, best move away quite quickly. The way you get them out of the trap is calmly approach them from the front, right? So their rear is not facing you. And then as from as far away as you can, throw a heavy blanket over the trap. And then they won't be spraying. They can't see you. And also you got the blanket in between. And then, you know, go to the rear door, open it up and back away quickly. Okay, how about a possum? So possums are not, um, they're also very uh, gentle. They have very poor eyesight, especially in the daytime. Um, But again, just to avoid any scratches or anything like that, cover the trap with a heavy blanket and don't let the trap touch your leg if you're carrying it. Hold it, you know, as far away from you as possible. You you probably don't have to get as drastic as with the raccoon where you really should have two people with some type of broomstick or something so that there's no chance their claws can get at you. With a possum, you just need to hold the trap away from your side. Now, the trick with possums is, especially in the daytime when they can't see well, you want to release them at the base of a tree or the edge of a woods so they don't have to try to find their way. What you don't want to do is you know, release them out in the open and have them scrambling around trying to figure out how to hide. Okay, chickens, especially for those of you in Hawaii, where we have quite a large uh, feral chicken population. They're voracious eaters of, of cat food, and they'll march right into the traps. So that they're, they're really not dangerous. You just have to be careful if you trap a hen and her chicks, because the hen will be very aggressive because she's trying to protect her chicks. So uh, use a divider if you need to, to get them away from the rear door, and then open it up and just let them out. How do you avoid these situations in the first place? Well, fortunately, all these guys like something besides cat food. So you can just distract them with food that they love and the cats don't. And here's some examples, like with raccoons, they love apples. They love marshmallows of all things. Not saying you should feed them a lot of them, but if you sprinkle some slices of apples uh, some distance from your traps, the raccoons are much more likely to go after that than go into the traps. Possum, you can see they like acorns, um, tomatoes, apples, bananas, uh, skunks, Nuts, apples, bananas, peanut butter. Again, you're giving them food that they prefer. It keeps them out of the traps. And with chickens, what we'll do is we'll get a um, big bag of chicken feed. Well, with chickens, the best thing to do is trap at night when they're asleep. Same thing with these other wildlife. They're usually nocturnal. 
So if you can trap during the day, you can often avoid them. So you use the food if you can't, or if they're not, you know, sometimes they do come out in the daytime. But with the chickens in the daytime, if you have to trap then, we'll make a big pile of chicken feed 10 yards away from where we're trapping, and they'll go running over and eating that and uh, stay out of the traps. Uh, winter trapping, we, we often like to do that because uh, no kittens and no pregnancies. It's just a lot easier. It's colder, but it's uh, a lot less complications. The trick with uh, winter trapping is they're fine. If, if you're working with a clinic, that's experienced, so they're not shaving that much off, and the spay incisions are small. As long as you know they have warm and dry shelter, you can trap during the winter. And if we're not sure, we'll put shelters out before the trapping and get them used to um, sleeping in there so that we know that they have a place to go, you know, where they'll be okay. Obviously, if there's a storm or it's extremely cold, uh, you probably want to hold off on the trapping or keep them for a couple more days before you let them go. One of the tricks you can do in the wintertime is look for paw prints. That will tell you paths of travel that you might want to put traps on in addition to the, uh, putting traps around their feeding area. It also lets you spot whether there are cats in an area is if you start to see cat paw prints in the snow. Another tip when you're releasing cats, try to release them at a spot where they can quickly run under cover. This makes them less frightened. Also, they just had surgery, so it puts a little less stress on them. So try to avoid releasing them in a spot where they have to go run across an open field or climb a fence or you know, sometimes you can't avoid it. But like in this case, this kitty only had to run about three or four feet before he was under cover. So if you can, you know, try to do that. Okay, and then before we close and take questions, I want to kind of point out how you can use a lot of these tricks in combination. And the bigger your grab bag, you know, the more opportunity you have in these really tough spots. So I'm going to tell you uh, the story of what we call the retrapping of uh, Lulu. And what you're looking at in this slide is a large rock wall uh, at a hotel. The kitty in this photo, you can see he's ear tipped. He's already fixed. We weren't after him, but I wanted to show you where this kitten that we were after did live. So what happened was we trapped this uh, little black and white feral kitten, probably about nine to 10 weeks old. And this was a good spot. It's part of our regular maintenance trapping for this for this site. And we don't do feral kitten socialization and, and there was no one available to do it. So since it was a decent colony, well-maintained, we released her. Well, the next day after we let her go, a hotel employee came up to us and said he wanted to adopt her. Lulu was, was her name, but he told us he was leaving on vacation in a few days and he needed to get her home before he left. So we have a feral kitten we just released and we only have a few days to recapture her if she's gonna get a home. So we decided we'd give it a try and then to make our matters worse, when we got there, two days after we'd let her go, we found a large empty plate of recently eaten wet food at the base of the wall where the cats were normally fed. So now we had to trap a feral kitten who we just trapped and let go, who lived in this really inaccessible spot and who had probably just eaten. And there she is hiding out in the wall. So how did we go about this? So we decided, since this was a fairly large colony of cats, we decided to actually trap in the middle of a hot day. Normally you would not do that, but that's because we figured the adult cats would all be asleep and stay out of our way. That's why you don't trap in the middle of a hot day. But Lulu being a kitten, was more likely to be active and running around while all the adults were uh, napping. We took a trap, we camouflaged it with that green sunscreen netting that I showed you before, um, including the floor, we covered up the floor. We placed it at the base of the wall uh, among some foliage, and then we baited it with sardines, like the smelliest thing we could think of. We stepped back as far as we could, but still be able to observe the site. Lo and behold, we spotted Lulu, peering out from between some of the boulders, like near the top of that wall. So we hoped she'd come down, but instead she curled up to take a nap. So at that point, you know, we didn't want her going to sleep. So we took out our laser pointer and we ran it, the red fly above her head to try to get her attention and get her active. And it worked. She started chasing the dot. But when we tried to get her to follow it down, the wall towards the trap, she, she wasn't going for that. She would only stay up on top and play with it. So next we got a YouTube video of uh, kittens meowing 
and we put the phone at the bottom of the wall. And that did the trick. A few minutes later, we saw her come climbing down the wall. And a few moments after that, we heard the trap door shut. So today, Lulu is in uh, her forever home with another kitten from that colony. So it just goes to show how, you know, if you're persistent and you're creative and you've got this bag of tricks, uh, you, you can overcome even um, an extremely difficult uh, situation like this one. Uh, that's it for our presentation, other than, uh, you know, we can take a few minutes of questions. There have been several questions out there about injured kitties and dealing with those complications. So there's the issue of getting the cat trapped and brought into the veterinarian and getting the help that the kitty needs, but also then handling the extra costs with regards to that. Do you have some thoughts? We do a lot of crowdfunding for our kittens. So obviously, if you're working with an organization that has an internet presence, um, has an email list, tell a good story. Don't just say, hey, there's an injured kitten, give us some money, but tell the story of the kitten and the personality and how the kitten was rescued and what the exact needs are. Email we find is, is effective. Facebook has got to be a little more sophisticated. But um, that, that's how we raise money for injured kittens is basically through crowdfunding on social media. People are very sympathetic to these cases. With an injured cat, you most likely would drop trap in those situations? Depends on the injury. You know, injured cats, yeah, a drop trap is usually going to be the safest. Like if they have a maybe a broken leg, um, something like that, and if they're kind of limping, it might be hard for them to go into a box trap. Although you'd be surprised at, at how agile they still are. But uh, yeah, the drop trap would be the preference to avoid any further injury. Really, the hardest cases aren't injured cats. It's the ones that are congested and are having trouble smelling the bait. That's that's a hard. That's when you have to use super smelly stuff. And uh, maybe they have to get really hungry. And it takes it can take a couple of tries. But those the injured cats are usually not the hard ones because they're so hungry and they can smell. It's the ones with the clogged noses that you have to try extra hard with really super smelly bait. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Bye.